going to ask uh, Wayne Gilchrist to be our next uh, speaker. Asking a congressman to speak for five minutes is uh, not an easy matter, but I'm asking a professor to speak for five minutes is not an easy matter either. So I want to introduce you to, although I'm sure you know uh, Congressman uh, Gilchrist, he's the co-founder, as I said before, of the Congressional Dialogue Caucus. He's a member of the House Natural Resources Committee and the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and the Climate Change Caucus as well. Um, Representative Gilchrist is a decorated uh, Vietnam vet uh, who knows something about warfare and is also a uh, friend of and expert on diplomacy. Uh, and we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much, Dr. Rubenstein. I'll try to take four minutes. Um, and I want to thank uh, Trita for his statement. We've been having conversations now, I guess maybe close to a year. Um, and Trita has been extremely helpful in this process to create a dialogue caucus in, um, in the House of Representatives. Myself and Gregory Meeks have started this uh, some time ago after our visits to Iraq and a number of other countries in the Middle East. Uh, and we are pursuing this on many, many different levels. Um, all of us come to this issue of Iran uh, based on our own life experiences. We have a frame of reference upon which we um, have the curiosity to learn, to solve problems, and to figure it out. Um, I was in Vietnam 1966, 1967. I experienced that conflict as a rifleman in the Marine Corps uh, and experienced the brutality of man's inhumanity to man close up, not from a distance. Um, so when I came back from Vietnam, I was curious as to how we got involved in Vietnam from a soldier's perspective. And I began to read books. You all, many of you will remember the Pentagon Papers. And I found Ho Chi Minh to be intriguing, especially after I found out that in 1918 he went to Paris to try to meet President Wilson to pursue um, uh, Wilson's dream of uh, international or, or a country's ability to be sovereign within its own right and to get rid of colonialism. That never really took hold until near the end of World War II in 1945 when a man named Archimedes Patty was on a troop ship in the Mediterranean Sea ready to make the invasion of Anzio. When he was given new orders, he was in the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, to go find out who this man Ho Chi Minh was in Vietnam and whether or not the U.S. should um, arm the French to fight the Japanese near the end of the war or just uh, um, not do that. Well, to make a long story short, Archimedes Patty, who I actually talked to in 1991 after I became a member of Congress, um, read Ho Chi Minh and he recommended that uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, be given uh, the same courtesy that we were giving the Philippines to gain their independence. The point of that is Ho Chi Minh, in the beginning, pursued the United States as a friend in his dream to get out from colonial rule. Uh, things never quite worked out. There wasn't enough information to the right people over the years to prevent that from happening. And we had this horrendous conflict that went from 1945 to 1975. At, during that period of time, many of us in the room were coming of age. Marine Corps, college, it was the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And during that time, we remember Khrushchev pounding his shoe on the podium at the United Nations, pointing his finger at the Western diplomats, including Henry Cabot Lodge, saying, we will bury you. And they certainly had deployable nuclear weapons. And Eisenhower's response was to invite Khrushchev to the United States, to tour our, our, tour our cities and to tour our farms. We remember when there were nuclear deployable weapons in Cuba, minutes, seconds, literally, away from the United States. Kennedy pursued a dialogue, and things were tense for a while, but we worked our way out of that. Nixon went to China. During that period of time, the one person we didn't have a dialogue with was Ho Chi Minh, and more than a million lives were lost. So as I come into this idea of a dialogue, and today we're discussing Iran, um, I know that the 
the diverse ingenuity, the collective ingenuity of individuals across this globe can find a way. It's not easy. We're not naive. This is, this is not overly idealistic. But there are people that can find a way to reduce this apprehension, reduce this uh, rhetoric, reduce the dogma, get rid of the ignorance, get information through knowledge and acquisition. Uh, and we can find a way to open up an avenue of discussion where war is obsolete. And another, another thing that many of us remember some years ago, I think it was 62, maybe 63, when President Kennedy went to the Berlin Wall and he uttered those famous words, we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future and we are all mortal. Um, Congressman Meeks and myself have had a number of discussions with Ambassador Zarif. We've talked to members of the Chamber of Commerce uh, from Tehran. We've talked to members of the Chamber of Commerce in Syria. Uh, we've had this dialogue and when we were talking to Zarif in New York City, the thing that sparked this sort of instant understanding of two human beings on this planet was that um, we understood that the sun rises the same for everybody, the sun sets the same for everybody, and we're pursuing individual lives for our children to be successful, and his two children live in Long Island. It's, it's a road that's fraught with difficulties, but we have the ingenuity, if we have the initiative, uh, to create a peaceful, a peaceful place. Thank you.